copyrighted program created for the Rio Grande Oil Company. Help! Police! 
Robert, there they are. Stop them. Right. Yes. Come out with that gun, but Bob. You will come steal money from me. Help, police. Shut up. Hey. You. Hey. What's you. Come on here. What's that oh, call you? Call you. I'm a deputy marshal. Oh, well, it's nothing. Officer Josh fell out of argument. Well, look at all these people watching us. Put up your gun. Look, I'm not armed. Very well, well, but who's this? Ah, well, my friend here just met a guy that has a grudge against them. Let him fight it out. No, they can't do that. They'll have to take him in. Hey, look here, you man. Look out, he's got a knife. Uh, I'm going to meddle with me, you sneaking flat Ah, uh, Well, that's one of them. Look out, Bob. I'm going to bump off the other one. Oh, hey, let it go. Oh, come on, boy. Well, let's get out of here quick. Almost seconds before a police radio car has arrived at the scene of the crime. Detective Lieutenant Frank E. Ryan on his way home for dinner, seeing the crowd park his car and investigate. Oh, Ricky, what's what trouble? Traffic accident? Now this time, Frank, it's murder. One man stabbed to death and another shot. A hold up. Oh, nice mess, isn't it? I, I saw the whole thing, officer. Did I heard that young fellow tell the officer to put his gun away. <laughs> Murder, all right. Will you please give this officer over here your name and address? Oh, yes, I'd, I'd be glad to. Do you think you could recognize these men if you saw them again? Oh, I'd recognize that black-haired one anywhere. I'll uh-huh. never forget those terrible eyes. Look like a mask, man, I tell you. Well, Frank, here are a couple of clothes. Hmm, Laura. Full-style Ira Johnson, huh? Yeah, that's right. And this oh. one's even better. Well, Bill Foles, any identification in it? Yeah, receipt for a radio. Sold to a William Arrington who lives on South Bixville Street. Fine. I'm going to run that one down right now. An hour later, Joe Taylor, chief of detectives, holds counsel of war with Inspector Detectives Davidson and Detectives Joe Filkus and Bill Baggett. This doesn't look like an amateur's job to me. The fact that these fellows would commit murder rather than submit to arrest shows they couldn't stand a pinch. Now, it's my guess that they've done time somewhere before this. And from what all the witnesses say, they are plenty tough. I should run across them, boys. I don't want to take any chances. Be ready for trouble. Oh, hello, Frank. Hello, oh, Steve. How'd you make out on that South Victor Street address? I didn't. The manager of the apartment house says there's never been anyone called Harrington to live there since he took the place over six years ago. That's a bad break. If those birds aren't rounded up tonight, we won't have a chance in a thousand of finding them. Maybe the fingerprints in that billfold and gun have made something. I'll call Barlow. Hello, Barlow. Taylor speaking. Get any prints in that billfold or revolver? Yeah. Okay. Goodbye. Prints are too smart to do any good. It's like the cards are stacked against us in this deal. No. Wait a minute. Let me see the receipt for that radio. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Here, yeah, Chief. Hmm. A great Western furniture company. Now, listen, Baggett. Take this receipt and go down there. Find out who that radio was sold to and what address it was delivered to. Yeah, but that place is probably closed. Well, there'll be a nice watchman around there. Talk to him. Get to the man who sold that radio. We've got to hit this thing tonight. Somebody wanting to buy a Christmas radio. <laughs> they pestered me half the night this time of year. Uh, yes, officer, just uh, step inside. I'll shut the door. Thanks. I'm trying to run down the sale of a radio. He's the receipt for it. Can you tell me who might have sold that machine? Well, now, uh, let me see. Uh huh. This number here, 1768, is it? Yeah. Well, that's the salesman's number. Let's just look in my book here. Yeah. Well, here we are. One seven six eight. He's uh Harry Dobbs. Well, can you get can you get him on the phone for me? Yes, I think I can. Uh, just uh, step back here, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, wait a minute, I'll switch on this mic. Oh, here we are. Uh, three, two, one, four, three. 
Yeah. 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 This is Lieutenant Baggett of the Los Angeles Police Force. I'm trying to get a line on the purchaser of a radio sold by you on November 16th. Yeah, I have the receipt here for a Tanazis portable model made out to William Arrington. You do? <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Wait until I get that written down. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the address. Fine. The whistle around. Fine. No, I can't stop to tell you what it's about now. Just read tomorrow morning's paper. In a very few moments, the detectives are interviewing the landlady at Whistle of Boston. Well, there's nobody but the name of Arrington lives here. Are you sure of that, ma'am? Yes, but the name lived here before. You see, I just took the house over two weeks ago. Well, who was the landlady before you? This is Rudolph Frank. And where does she live? Well, now, let's see. Oh, yes. She's at the Orange Hill Apartment House now. The Orange Hill Apartment. That's fine. Come on, boys. We're going to interview Mrs. <laughs> Because there was a Mr. Arrington lived there with his wife. He had a double apartment he showed Mr. and Mrs. O'Neill. And they you say they've moved Mrs. Fang? Yes, just a few days ago. Well, they can were... you imagine that? Arrington was about 25 years of age. How tall was he? Oh, I should say about six feet, and he had black eyes. What did and... O'Neill look like? Well, I should say he was younger, around 21 or two. He had light brown hair, and his teeth sort of stuck out. Would you call him a blonde? Well, some would have guessed. He was a good deal lighter than Arrington. So you have no idea where these people went, huh? No. No, I haven't. But he took the suitcases in the radio and called a taxi cab and drove away. Taxi cab? What kind of taxi cab? Why, um... Let's see, um... You've got to remember, Mrs. Stang. Well, I... I do remember well, What kind was it, Ron? A green top. Yeah, I- I'm sure. It was a green top. That's mm-hmm. fine, Mrs. Stang, and thanks a million. Come on, boys, down to the green top office. <laughs> short time, the driver who called for Evington and O'Neill and their wives is located in faces of threatening detectives. Now listen, Blackie, a lot depends on your memory. Within the last week, did you answer a call to the Orange Hill Apartments and take away two couples from two cases and a radio? Let's see, uh, seems to me I did. Yeah, that was last Thursday, wasn't it? It might have been. Sure, I remember that, Church. Where'd you take them? Let me look at my book a minute. Uh, yeah, here it is. They went to the Shropshire Apartments on West 6th Street. Oh, yeah, that was where I carried their radio all the way back to Apartment 3. And all this guy gives me is a dime. The radio was heavy, too. And then one of the broads asked me to connect it up. The noise. What did these men look like? Sort of tough guys. But they could be cut down to size. One of them had black hair, and the other sort of meh color. Did you get what I mean? Yeah, I guess we do. You remember anything else, Blackie? No, I guess that's about all. Okay, Blackie, and thanks. Not at all, not at all. Never hurts to be on the right side of the fence, if you get what I mean. Well, boys, let's get started for that sixty spot. <laughs> Not with their following each meter clue, the detectives arrived to stop the apartment on 6th Street. Yeah, it's almost 11 o'clock. I suppose this is one of those places where they lock the doors after 10. I hadn't thought about that. Oh, it is. Oh, you have to ring the bell. No, wait a minute. That might spill the beans. We've got to get in there. Huh? Listen, you fellas wait here. I'll see if I can get in the back way. Okay. Ryan lets himself in by the back door of the apartment house and a moment later admits his colleagues to the front entrance. They look about for the manager's apartment. Here it is, number two. Who is it? Open up, ma'am. It's police officer. The police? Well, what's the matter? Well, what's the matter? What's happened? I want to know. 
But I want to know what's the matter. Now tell me this minute. I want to you have to be more quiet. Well, all yeah, right, all right, but then she can That's a good idea. You stay out here in the hall, Baggett. Let us know if you see anyone that resembles a suspect. Okay. If you don't mind, ma'am, we'll step inside. But I wasn't expecting visitors. Why, well, I hardly know what to do. Don't oh, mind us, ma'am. We're just folks. Well, all right. Now, for land's sake, what is the matter? Well, ma'am, have you a couple of tenants by the name of Arrington and O'Neill? Uh-huh. Possibly accompanied by their wives? Yeah, they're here. Uh-huh. What? Well, what have they done? Well, there was a nasty shooting at Savin Street over on Vermont early this evening, and one man was killed. And them fellas did it? Well, we don't know about that, but we want to talk to them. Are they in their apartment now? Well, I don't think so. I saw them go out about 9 o'clock, all four of them. I mean, you heard them come back yet. Oh, great Scott, Inspector. Do you suppose they've land on us again? Are you certain they'll be back, ma'am? Well, I hope so. I'd hate to be beat out of my rent. Wouldn't be so hard for them to sneak out of the back way with their grip. No, oh, I've had it happen before. I'll just take a look in their apartment right now. Now, wait a minute. Let's see. Here. Here's the key, number three. You can go with you, ma'am. Well, all right. Anything sign up, Baggett? No, all right. Good. Keep your eyes open. We're going back to look at the apartment. All right. Yes. Here we are now. Number three. We are our knock first. On your toes, Frank. I am. Well, I guess they're not here, all right. So wait, wait, wait until I switch on the light. Now well, that's better now. Let's see. Well, I guess they'll be back. Look, here's their clothes in the closet, and their radio's still here. That's fine. Now we'll just wait here, ma'am, until they get back. Well, what can I do? You can help most of you just remain quietly in your apartment. Well, all right. But look here. Don't you go messing up this place. Don't worry, we won't. No, it's uh, You ask that officer who's at the door to step back here. Oh, well, all right. Looks like these birds are wise to the racket, all right. Jumping around from one place to another every week or two. Hard to move every time they put a job, huh? What a life. One skip ahead of the law. You'd think they'd learn. Yeah, but they're too stupid. You've got to be stupid to be a crook. I guess you're right there, Frank. Want to see me, Inspector? Yes, Bill. You wait in the landlady's apartment. Keep watching when you see this bunch come in. Give them plenty of time to get back here. We'll be waiting for them. Right. Uh, let's get the lay of this place. Hmm. There's these two double apartments. I guess you the first door here you connect with the other half of the establishment. Locked from the other side. Well, then they might come in from the other apartment, huh? They might. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> let me get at that lock. I think I can pick it open. Might just as well have something to do while we're waiting. For an hour and a half, the two detectives wait. Then, at half past midnight, they hear footsteps. Exchanging a meaningful glance, they draw their guns. Wait a minute. Something's crazy. Don't that man, Bill. You there. Put your hands behind you and turn around. Come on. Stand still. Here's a pair of papers for you. Shut up. What's this all about? That's what you're going to tell us. Keep your eye on this mug and these gals here, Bill. Come on, Inspector. Let's get the other guy. There he goes in that taxi with the lights off. Well, can you imagine that? Well, come on. Let's hear the rest of them in. Did you see him? No, he made his getaway in the cab. He didn't go through here. I was watching the door after they came in. Might have seen him. Yeah, he got out somewhere. Maybe you wounded him, Inspector, huh? I'm afraid not. Those shots were fired at the lock that jammed when I tried to get out of the apartment. Not at our departed friend. Oh, 
although O'Neill readily admits his identity, he denies all knowledge of or complicity in the murder of the young Debbie DeMarco or shooting of Albert Kahn. The next day, Lieutenant Ryan takes O'Neill to the Cedars of Lebanon Hospital to face his victim of the previous night. You may come in now, Lieutenant. Thank you. Uh, it's gone. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I'm pretty weak. But all in all, not too bad. Oh, sure. It looks well. <laughs> they say you'll be out of here in no time. I hope so. Who's this issue? Aha, the robber. So you've caught them. So, so good business it is, Lieutenant. This, uh, this is the man that tells you up then, huh? Uh, uh, that's one of them. He tried to kill me. But it was the black heaven that shot me. The guy's screwy. I never seen him before in my life. You, you, you tried to deny it. You little puppy. If I was hiding there, I... Mr. Khan, you must be quiet. You'd better go, Lieutenant. Very well. Come on, O'Neill. just identified O'Neill as one of the two men who robbed and shot him. Is that correct, O'Neill? Oh, I guess I'm hooked, all right. Yeah. You ready to shot? Yeah, I guess so. Hand me Mr. Margopher to take a statement. How much did you get for this job, O'Neill? Twelve bucks was my cut. <laughs> Bill said he lost all the silver in the fight, and we only had $24 in table when we got back. Twelve bucks for a human life, huh? Well, that guy had no right button in. Where's Bill going, O'Neill? How should I know? <laughs> Are you sure you don't know? If I did, I wouldn't tell you, Dick. You've got me? Aren't you satisfied? No. Are you? You want to take this rap by yourself? What difference does it make? Besides, I don't know where Bill's gone. Only I'll bet he gets as far away from Los Angeles as possible. On twelve dollars. Twelve dollars will take some guys a long way. O'Neill is booked on a charge of suspicion of murder. His wife and Harrington's girlfriend are held two days as material witnesses. But when they convince the police that they know nothing about the case, they are released. With only O'Neill in custody, the work of the police is but half finished. Ryan ponders ways and means of arriving at a complete solution of the crime. Inspector, I'm convinced that this other man, Harrington, or Bill, or whatever his name is, has a criminal record. Yes, but how are they going to locate him with nothing more than an eyewitness description? Well... There is a way. <laughs> may take years. What's that? I'm going to start with the mug book of the hold-up men, and I'm going to ask those witnesses one by one to go through them with me until we find the man we want. Go to it. <laughs> After nearly two weeks of consulting witnesses, one of them recognizes a picture that might be Arrington. The suspected interview, but does not match the description of height and weight, and is furthermore by no means a professional criminal. Ryan continues his search of the mud book for a man taller than the first suspect, but resembling him otherwise. On January 23, 1931, just a month after the crime, he finds the mug of one William Hudson, whose picture is immediately and unanimously identified by the various witnesses as the murderer. Police bulletins bearing Hudson's, alias Errington's picture and fingerprints are broadsided across the country. Finally, on February 7th, word comes that Hudson had been arrested in Salt Lake City on the vacancy charge several days previous. On direction from Los Angeles, Hudson is held. And Ryan travels north with an Oregon boot, a leg iron weighing 30 pounds, to bring back his man. Hudson doesn't open up to Ryan until they're on the train on the way back. 
And then Ryan employs some subtle psychology on her. Well, now that we're all settled down, Ryan, I'm warning you there's no use trying to get nothing out of me. What are you getting at? I ain't answering no questions, see? Well, I hadn't intended to ask any. Well, that's a good thing. Because I ain't the blabbing kind, get me? You can't make me talk. I'm tough and I can take it, see? Say, you are tough, aren't you? I wouldn't want to get in the jam with you myself. Yeah, and you'd be right there. Well, I guess there's plenty more like me. Take that little girl that was cashiering in that restaurant in Spring Street that you and O'Neill held up last month. You know, she told me that O'Neill did all the talking, but it was you she was scared of. Said it was the way you kept looking at her. <laughs> She's a smart kid. She knows her onion. Yeah, and that, and that girl, that girl in the drugstore out near West Lake Park. You remember her? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> What'd she say? Said she had hysterics for an hour after you left. Hmm? Said she'd never seen such a mean-looking man in her life. Well, when I go into a place, I let them know that I mean business. Sure you do. I can see that. But this fella Khan, you know, <laughs> he seemed to have plenty of nerve. No, he was a fool. He didn't know what a tough guy he was up against. Uh, come near letting him have it. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather I can smart one, too. You know, I've often wondered. I wonder how you ever knew we were in that apartment waiting for you that night. Well, I had a hunch. When I got the door half open, I thought I saw something moving, so I took it on the land. Yeah? Where'd you go? Still away in that taxi? Taxi, nothing. I was up the stairs before you knew what was coming off. I went up to the roof, jumped across to the building next door, watched you fellas look for me, and then come down the fire escape after you'd gotten tired and gone home. <laughs> that's how it was, eh? Yeah. Well, I guess us detectives were pretty dumb that time. That time? Was there any time when you wasn't dumb? Well, I, uh, I can't seem to remember, I do, but, uh... You know, it's you that's wearing the Oregon boots, if I'm not mistaken. Well, well, that's just because I slipped up. I shouldn't have come by way of Salt Lake City where to pick up the bad bag. Well, that's one way of explaining it. Hey. Hey, tell me, Ryan. Did anyone ever get away with one of those Oregon boots locked on them? Let me see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I believe there was a case four or five years ago up in Idaho. Well, I got away, and they didn't find him until three years later. Well, how did he get the boot off? He didn't. It was still locked around the skeleton of his leg. Both of these men were brought before justice to answer for their crimes which they did in full on October the 2nd, 1931, when they were hanged in Fulton Prison. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, don't miss the thrilling clue case next week. Read about it and the many other pieces which are now being broadcast twice each week in the new September issue of the Calling All Cars News. Any Rio Grande dealer will gladly give you a free copy of this unique publication of illustrated crime, movie, and radio news. Boys and girls will find a full page of gifts, which are offered free to all users of Rio Grande Class Gasoline. Every time you purchase gasoline, you help some youngster get a junior detective outfit by merely specifying Rio Grande Cracks. And you do yourself a favor as well. For no other gasoline on this market can give you greater speed or power. Very few brands can even equal the outstanding performance of Rio Grande Cracks. It costs no more to get the only gasoline that gives you police car performance. Rio Grande dealers, all of them independent merchants, unite in recommending Sinclair motor oil to their customers. 
from practical experience, they have learned the folly of using oils that contain wax and useless petroleum jelly. At last, they have de waxed, de jellied oils made by Thin Claire, which cost only 25 cents and 30 cents a quart in steel cans. Every Rio Grande dealer urges you to use Thin Claire motor oil because you can unqualifiedly guarantee that it will never fail to lubricate your motor correctly.